back to that because having the threat of cancer all the time is so daunting. And I can manage it day to day when I'm not taking on too much. But when I'm taking on too much, I never look anxious, but I'm anxious all the time. Like I'm just going to scream and I need to surround myself around people that it's okay to say that to. Yeah. Um, and I was not, I was surrounding myself in environments where I had to cover it up all the time. And it's just not healthy. It's not. And you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, they go, they go for the food, they go to work out, they go do all these other things. And that's not the number one place we need to focus on is. The way hey guys, it's Bonnie here. I am in the middle of editing this episode and I wanted to just hop in and say, hi, welcome to Healthy in a Wild World. This is going to be a little bit different than our usual. Courtney and I got together and talked for a little over four hours. And we decided that there were quite a few good nuggets within our episode. So we're sharing the juiciest bits and pieces with you. I invite you to look around, listen in, sit back, relax, enjoy. This is going to be one of the more motivating stories you have heard. Um, Courtney's been through a lot. She has. And, and I would love to hear your thoughts on her story. And if you want to join in on our conversation, because it is still going, you guys, we have continued to chat about all of these topics and really just catch up with everything. So if you want to join in the conversation, come on into the community. Um, Link is in the show notes. What's also in the show notes are chapter links. So if there's a specific topic that you want to come back and revisit, look in the chapter notes. You'll see the topics that we talked about um, and you'll see where her exact story is. So Welcome to Healthy in a Wild World. <laughs> Let's get to it, shall we? <laughs> um, but anyway, some of the things that she's saying lead me to to think that she actually needs a much different protocol than what I'm giving her. I think it would help her. I think she needs to go there first. But do you call people out on it? Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. It's my okay. job. It's my job. We have to have a tough conversation tomorrow. She and I are going to talk about it tomorrow. Um, but I, I think what she's doing is she's sabotaging herself and. She's not 100% in this program and she's not going to see results until she is. And I just had that conversation with someone about going forward after I'm done and how difficult it's been working with this person because she just, I said, I'm not sure you want to get better. I said, I think you like negative attention. And I said, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm just not here for that. So if you're, I said, it's like hitting my head on a wall. If you, you want to get better, I'm here for it. If you're not ready, then wait till you're ready. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but um, it's very different when you're dealing with who I'm going to be dealing with in the criminal justice field, because those people are court ordered. You either decide to become a, this part of this program because you have something to, to gain from it, or you decide you want to stick to your own ways. And right now in my life, with me wanting to choose me right now, I can deal with those people a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. And see, I have very little patience for the whole sugar addiction thing. Okay. Yeah. And what, in what ways? Is there sugar um, in there? I don't think so. No, I don't think Bubbly has any. It just, it drives me crazy um, to hear people blame other things for sugar. And I understand it and I know where it's coming from, but it frustrates me. And I don't think it's fair because the frustration isn't with the sugar addiction itself. I know it's there. I know it plays on people and I know exactly what it does. My frustration comes from, I don't know how to get it through your head that this is what's happening. It's funny because as I'm trying to be healthier, I'm looking at sugar in everything. And so when I saw, I think you saw me post it too. When I saw how much sugar was in different pasta sauces and the sugar in different yogurts, it's funny because it's a trick. They don't tell you how much sugar is in there. I know, we, I know we're taught to read labels, but it doesn't tell you that there's this much sugar or that much sugar. And, it, and it's like, it's deceiving because you think because you're eating yogurt, you're doing well, but you're not. Right. Right. And some of the sugar is derived from food and some of it is added and they don't tell you which one's added and which one's from the food. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which makes it a much more complicated. And that that's kind of where my frustration lies. And, you know, I have no issue talking to someone for hours about trying to manage an autoimmune condition because they've hit a place in their brain where and how do you know it's an autoimmune? Um, nothing's working right. You're getting okay. sick for no reason. Nothing's working the way that it should. Um, and it doesn't have to be a full hundred percent dysfunction leading into illness. It could, but it be, could be better. Yeah, it could be better. Okay. You know, and if you have chronic stress in your life, then chances are something's happening with your autoimmune condition or your autoimmune oh. function. Okay. You know, there's some degeneration of it and there's some malfunction within there that may not be full on illness yet, which means there's hope that you can recoup it. But I mean, how many of us aren't chronically stressed? Oh, I always know. <laughs> I'm starting a new green drink. It's supposed to come Friday. I'm just trying to get in more vegetables. I don't savvy. 
issued another drink and it's a green drink. I used to love green drinks and I need to get back to them because I don't take it in, in enough vegetables. Also with Ozempic, you're full so fast that if you don't put your protein first, sometimes you can't get the, the amount you need. Well, I guess I could, but sometimes I don't plan well enough. And so I'm full and I don't have enough vegetables or enough nutrition. So I definitely think that's part of my issue um, yeah. of getting in. And sometimes I don't eat enough. Yeah. I know the nutritionist I was seeing was telling me she wants me to eat out of every single food group and she doesn't really want me to drink my food, like protein shakes and stuff. I think they're okay sometimes, but I guess they're not okay as a go-to. Mm -mm. They're not, they're not, but you know, I like, I have greens out in the kitchen mm -hmm. and it's just an organic green blend. Um, something I got locally from one of the herbalists around here and, oh, no. and you can make your own. I just, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not either. Never mind. I might have good intention, but I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. No, that will never be me. Um, but I use it for the days that I just, I lose track of time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, like I started having uh, protein shakes in the house consistently after the boys were born or probably before, no, before, because when I was pregnant, I wasn't getting enough protein in because you're supposed to have this astronomical amount when you're pregnant with twins. And I could never get it in because to get that volume, I would have to have dairy, but I can't have the dairy. So it was like, this cycle and it was just ridiculous that I found but you I lost all of your baby weight plus some yeah wow yeah and I think I have I have 20 pounds to go to get back to like pre-fertility really yeah I'm at 175 so 155 is I was fluctuating between 135 and 155 wow and see for me I haven't seen the scale go down until the end of May when I started Ozempic, but it's not, it's, you know, the more I eat, when I, when I really plan out my foods and eat well, I lose more. Um, I know my life is a little crazy moving new job, a job I don't like. So I eat out a lot at work. Um, and I don't think there's a way around that from now to Friday because I'd rather have my own food, but now I'm like trekking into the city and bringing like carrying my computer and whatever. So I just try and eat better, but I eat a lot less like one portion from a restaurant now is like three portions to me, at least. So I just try to pick better things, but the portion size is dramatically different. I'm full after a few bites. Like I have to force myself to eat at least, you know, a third of it. I'm just not hungry, but I do enjoy the food. I, I stopped enjoying food. I guess when you first become diabetic, you're like insatiable. Nothing is good. Nothing's enough. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Because in reality, if you ate everything on that menu in an entire day, like one serving of all of it, because all of it is so plant-based, there's it's 80% plants. Wow. Yeah. It's what it is. It looks like a lot of food to me. It does, but it's a, it's a lot of plants. So you, okay. you can eat a lot of plants. <laughs> yeah. No, I believe you. You've been doing this for so long. I know you're good at what you do. So I, I need to look at this. Um, what do you call it? Grocery store list. Yeah. That's the other thing. Reading the first ingredient on things has definitely been eye-opening because it's not always what you think it is. No, it's not. Yeah. But you said I can make most of it and just eat on it throughout the week. Yeah. So like the veggie soup, I threw that in my crock pot. So I made all the main meals during a YouTube episode. And here's what I did. Yeah. All at once. It took me an hour and a half to prep all the main things. I did the wraps. I did the sheet pan. I did the minestrone soup. What's the sheet pan? So basically you take a cookie sheet or a baking sheet, you put everything in there, you pop it in the oven. A pineapple? Oh, that sounds so good. And then you just, you eat it. I don't eat okay. absorbent amounts of bad food. Like the like if I want Chex Mix or if I want like something, I can't even eat a whole snack bag now. It's like, I want a portion. I want a taste. I don't want the whole thing. Um, but I do always worry about gaining the weight back already. And I know that's mental and I know that I have to deal with that. Because it's 30 pounds and I'm not going to wake up and be 30 pounds more unless I'm really doing something. Right. But it doesn't feel real at all. I don't see a difference. I can't tell you I totally feel a difference. Um, I know it's different, but I don't see it at all yet. So I don't know when I will. I don't know if I will. Six months, six months three to six months. But it's been major since you lost that weight. Well, gradually over. Okay. So, seven what, so where you're sitting today. You're I'll see six months. Here. You will see yourself today in, in six months. It takes three to six months for us to see ourselves. Really? Mm -hmm. So the person you'll be in six months, let's say you've lost all the weight. When you look in the mirror in six months, you'll see you from today. That's 
crazy. That can we change that? You have to take a lot of pictures. Okay. That's the way you do it. You take a lot of pictures. And I did the 75 hard and I don't regret it, but I would never do it again. It's too much for my body. Um, I wound up in a boot to work out from someone whose body I look capable, but after having cancer, radiation, chemo, osteoporosis, menopause, the whole thing, your bones, your body isn't what it used to be. And so I have to push myself, but I have to know the limit. And I just pushed too hard. And then I wound up in a boot. But it was still a good experience because it made me realize there are no excuses. If you want to find an excuse, there are, you can find every single one. But for 75 days, nobody mattered. Like it was just me for 75 days doing what I needed to do. And that mental part was awesome. I love that part of it. I love that part of it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people in that place. And, you know, one of the things I strive to do is make things easier. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't want a challenge to be so difficult that it negatively impacts your body. Mm -hmm. You must cringe though at the way most of us eat. No, because I used to eat the same way. I still have days where I'm like, although I will tell you, I had, um, I had Chick-fil-A like a month ago and I got into this really bad habit a year and a half ago mm -hmm. of being out and not having food with me, which is not normal for me. I always have snacks. Always, even before the boys, I always had something on my right bar or somewhere, right? And I got in a bad habit of it, and I stopped by fast food one too many times, and all of a sudden I was like, "Oh, I need to go get Burger King fries." And it was it was a wake up moment because I have not had that thought since I lost weight the first time, and that was twenty years ago. And it was like, "Whoa, okay, no." And then I was Christmas shopping last month, and I was out, and I could either stop at Panera or stop at Chick Fil A, and Chick Fil A didn't have a line, and I didn't have to get out of my car. <laughs> which was a real culprit between me driving through and I drove through and I got a kid's meal and I was done through the line. I'm like munching on the fries because I love their fries. Right. And I'm like, this is making me sick. I get happy. I feel horrible when I eat it. When yeah. I eat any fast food, not saying I don't, I do get kid's meals now compared to regular, Yeah, but I feel horrible after I eat it. Like yeah. just absolutely disgusting. Yep. The hardest thing for me though is to find breakfast food sometimes. Like, so you're, my nutritionist cringe when she was like, well, what do you, if you can have breakfast and semi-healthy, what would you want? I like a sausage from McDonald's with eggs, but the sodium in that little patty, it's horrible. So I tried to find other ways and there is no other way. It's just not a good thing for me to eat. No. Although I will tell you what we're doing today, actually for dinner <laughs> is we are meal prepping breakfast tacos with really? turkey sausage, turkey sausage, the Genio turkey sausage and eggs. And um, Brian wants potatoes in his, um, so he'll he'll get his potatoes, and then I have whole wheat tortillas. And, and then you're gonna meal prep them and and like wrap them up or freeze them or what? Them yeah, wrap them up, put them in the, you know those food saver bags. Yeah, and fill with all the air out. Yeah, I and just then, got one, a new one. Yeah. Okay, so I seal up two at a time. You cut the corner, microwave it for two minutes, let it let it cool because it will burn the crap out of your mouth. Um, there's enough moisture in there. Really? Makes it, you know, those soft tortillas that you get down here in the South? Yeah. So but good. what else could I use besides turkey sausage? I like turkey meat, but I don't like, for some reason, the smell of turkey sausage. That's one thing on Ozempic I noticed. It's almost like that pregnancy smell. Some things I can't smell. Could I do like, what about Trader Joe's chicken sausage or something? I haven't tried it yet, but something different. For some reason, I don't, it's a, I don't know if it's a texture. It's a smell texture thing. I don't know what it is. I get it. I get it. I can't do, um, I can't do steaks anymore. Brian tried to give me a steak. No, he used to love a good snake. I know. And it, like, I try so hard, but it grosses me out. He tried to give me a steak when I was pregnant and all I saw was the red juices. And from that point forward, I, I can't, wow. I can't do now, it. I can't do it often. Cause I feel guilty when I eat it. The last time I had one was when I was in Texas. Um, but I feel when I eat certain things, like I used to, or when I eat all of something, I feel guilty. And I know that that's, I don't do it all the time, but I think that's something else now that I'm on this and I don't usually eat a full meal when I eat the whole thing. I guess I get nervous about going back to the way I was. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. So you know, it's, it's such a mental game. It is. And with any of these things, the thing you need to look at, like you like the, the sandwiches or the tacos or whatever, right? Love breakfast. Food saver. So you just make it with the chicken, the, some poultry. Okay. You know, or even a, a vegan. I wouldn't even mind shredded regular chicken. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Not a sausage. Because a sausage is where it becomes the sodium, right? Right. And the big okay. thing with breakfast sausage is the sage and the fennel seeds. Okay. That's what makes sausage. So you could actually just get meat, shred it up if you want, whatever, 
and season it like whatever you want to taste like. If sausage is your, is your taste that you want in the morning, you can season the what you're making to taste like sausage. I think that's the whole thing. When I cook my own food, I am so much happier than when I buy food. Like there's a pizza place next door and every once in a while we'll get pizza. I don't really like it. It's Sicilian pizza. I don't really, I'm not good with dairy. It doesn't make me feel good. But if I were to make something at home, like one thing they do make in the back, which I just feel might be a little healthier. It's like some bow tie pasta with yeah. some shrimp, some, what is it? Those little green things. They're like olive tasting gherkins. I don't know what they are. I don't know, but it's shrimp and broccoli and just a little bit of that to, to me seems so much healthier than that piece of pizza. Yeah. Yeah. It but is. when I think out loud, I'm like, pasta, you feel like it's so bad, but a little bit of it is not horrible. It's not. It's not. The boys get it a lot. They love eating it. I'm going to let them eat it. They do. They eat so well. When I see their little meals and I see what they give them, I'm so jealous because they have been exposed to so much on their plate. And that is one thing. Not that I regret, but I wish was different with Mason, but it was so hard for us just to get him to eat with him being sensory. <clears throat> now we don't play into it totally. I make him taste things now. Um, yeah. I have to find that fine line because you don't want to force food on people, but he has to taste some things um, because then he'll be like, I like it. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really expose him to a ton of different foods because it was so hard to make him eat. So that is one thing I wish was different. You give those boys everything. We try. I, they don't get as many vegetables as I would like. I hide a lot of things. That's also part of the reason I got those greens is to hide it. Um, but they're getting better. So okay. like they're eating, you know, like last night, they had cucumbers and carrots and Keegan likes olives. Brian had them try. I olives. love olives. I can't stand olives to me are like. Oh, but isn't that cool that you don't like them, but you still introduced it to your son? Yep. You know, there are some things I don't eat that my husband and son love, but I'm just like a finicky eater. Yeah, me too. And I try, you should see me sometimes trying to hide my face. <laughs> oh yeah, because mm -hmm. I don't want them to learn that. Oh. Learn the face. So <laughs> I'm trying so hard. <laughs> Does the school ever tell you, wow, they really eat well? Like they're they're just so good about trying things and eating different things. They, they're in line with their classmates, which is good. Everybody there, like when they get cucumbers, everybody eats them. When they get carrots, everybody eats them. Um, and I really appreciate that they do that. They still but maybe it's the school they go to too. They go to a good school, so maybe they expose them to healthier foods. They do, although I will tell you one one of the days on their menu this month, it just says veggie straws, and I'm like, you know, that's just flour, right? <laughs> and it's not on a day that the kids are there, so I'm kind of like, I don't know if I should say something or not. I might say something. I haven't decided. They're not good for you, right? Veggie straws. I mean, yeah, no, like it's just flour. There's nothing, they're just chips. You know, it, it's not a substantial snack. It's just chips. <laughs> You'd be better off eating cut up vegetables. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and here's the thing if, do you have an air fryer? You have the air fryer oven still? Yeah. Okay. I don't have the oven, but I have an air fryer. Yeah. I have okay. a ninja. Um, air fry some of your vegetables. Yeah. Those are good. I tried it and it was a mental struggle to try it, but I tried air fried vegetables and it was Louisiana. delicious. I was making my own granola, mm -hmm. uh, making protein balls, making everything I ate, I'd make it. And your own granola compared to the granola you made in the store was is so different. But you know what? I didn't realize that my body, something wasn't going right. And so I would eat well for a while and then I would fall off because I thought I was doing something wrong because I wasn't losing. Right. Instead right. of going to a doctor or someone like you and saying, this is what I'm doing. What's wrong? And okay. so- I kind of think for me that Ozempic was just a jump start to say, hey, body, wake back up. What's going on? Um, and I wish I would have done it sooner. Not the Ozempic, but I wish I would have asked, said to somebody, I'm really trying. You know what? Let me say that differently. I said that. Nobody was listening. This doctor was the first one, I think, that really listened to me to say, how long have you been trying? Are you frustrated? Do you want to try something different? Because I think we look at weight and we almost are like numb to it we don't see it everybody kept saying you carry your weight well yeah I hate that statement I hate that statement because at your baby shower I was big and I don't feel good big and I, like it was the belly fat like I just could not lose it no matter what I did and if someone were to tell me to exercise more I could barely move right right and that's not a solution either you yeah. know the funny thing is is um when I was infertility and heavier um I kept getting told that I was carrying my weight well, right? 
But before I gained that weight, when I was my normal 135 to 155, or what I see as my norm, um, I was told I was too skinny. Yeah, yeah, when I was younger, I was too skinny. Like, dude, no. When I moved from Austin or from San Diego to Austin, I was too skinny. <laughs> There's no question about that. I was too skinny. But um, after that, no, I was fine. And it's funny you say that because you know what started my weight gain eventually, even before cancer, was fertility drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You need so much weight. You quickly. do. Quickly. Well, you're messing with your hormones. You're trying to get pregnant. You're miserable. You know, infertility is a very depressing thing, especially when people say all the wrong things. Yep. And nobody ever says the right thing. I have learned that. No one ever says the right thing. No, even after you have the baby, they ask you when there's another one. No, I'm lucky to have this one. I'm lucky. Yep. I still get people and, you know, I, I told one person, I was like, dude, I'm 50. I'm not having any more kids. I'm good. You have two healthy, happy babies and you had a successful twin pregnancy. What? I'm, I'm good. We are, we are, we are fine. And truth be told, I almost didn't make it through. They almost didn't make it through. We are going there again. Even if I was in my twenties and thirties, we are not going there again. No, to see your baby left at the hospital. That was so hard for me to see. So I can't imagine how it was for you and Brian. So I, yeah. Yeah. Now to come home with Lana, that had to be hard. Yeah. It was, it, you never know. Like even today, I don't know about Brian, but I always question myself. Like, could I spend more time there? Could I? And, and in reality, it was what it was. Uh, you just had a baby, you have a newborn and a husband at home, both are needy. And then you have a baby in the hospital who's fully taken care of. Mm-hmm. It's a little hard. Yeah. And that guilt has to tug at you every time you leave the ones at home for the one that's kind of taken care of. Right. Like there's, and I used to tell everyone I leave when I, when I leave the house, I cry. When I get to the hospital, I cry. When I leave the hospital, I and cry. And why are you breastfeeding home, too? I was trying. Um, I was pumping. I wasn't breastfeeding. Right. I was pumping. Um, Cause they didn't have that suck, swallow, breathe. Yeah, but pumping is exhausting. I really struggled pumping. I couldn't produce enough milk. Nobody told me that, hey, you had several tumors cut out as a child. They probably cut through all your glands. And I took tons of meds. I drank tons of water. I couldn't, I couldn't. Yeah, I had enough to support one, not two. And when they came home, when they both came home, or when when Keegan came home finally, they were we were trying to keep Drew on Keegan's schedule so that they would stay on the same schedule. And they just naturally shifted. So they were an hour apart. Oh my God. So seven at seven weeks, I looked at Brian. I was like, I am so done. We need, we need more formula. I'm done. I can't. Okay. I can't. But he was supportive. I'm sure. Was that hard as a nutritionist to go to formula? It was, I found a good one and it cost a fortune, but it allowed me to have the brain space to just be like, okay, we're all right. You know, it's hard. Yeah. It was, that was really hard. And he actually thought I should have stopped sooner. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's like, I wasn't expecting you to go this long. So you know, I can't like, imagine. I couldn't even get enough for one and you're trying to get enough for two. And then we have some people who are, have too much. Have donated half the milk that she produced and still See, have left over. That is one of the most amazing things to donate milk, in my opinion. That is magical for someone to actually think to do that. That is because people don't get how hard it, it, it was really hard for me and yeah. it was devastating. Yes. I'm like, why can't I do something my body is supposed to be able to do? Yes. I so was I, told that, you know, when you have twins and, and I knew just from my own experience in this field that like things aren't always what people tell you. you know, not everybody can do what they can do, what others can do. And I wasn't sure how it was going to work out. And then when we had to go in for my headache and everything worked out that way, like my, so my blood pressure was like 220, 220 over one something. Cause you had them early, right? I had them early. Um, I went into severe preeclampsia and they thought I was going to stroke out. And when that happened, I was like, okay. And like, I'm not going to pump anything. Like th- this is, this is it. Like, this was my sign that there's a reason it took so much for me to get pregnant is my body just is not happy pregnant. I was miserable. Oh, really? Yeah. I was miserable. I, it was torture. So I don't really know why I had the fertility issues when I look back now. Um, I did have endometriosis, which I didn't know. Um, I do have Lefermini, which I didn't know, which is a cancer-causing gene. And so my body is always fighting cancer. So I I do have low bone bone marrow. I'm just weird. My body is just weird. So when you put it all together, I mean, I'm sure that doesn't help you get pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. And and like my mom struggled and had multiple miscarriages. I'm sure. I'm sure there's something there. 
you know, we don't know enough. And and do you think some of it goes back to our nutrition because there's so much crap in our food? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Cause like, I didn't start really taking care of myself till I was 30. I definitely think that I am done taking care of people. And I think that just, I have a genetic disease. I have a genetic disorder. My dad died from it. My sister died from it. And I'm just, I'm ready to be more greedy and give more to my family. I want a job where if I'm sick that day where I don't feel like going in, I call in and somebody else will do it. I don't want a job where I have to call other people and tell them, put their needs ahead of mine. And, and I'm not, I'm not knocking therapy. I'm just done. Yeah. Yeah. And you know how it goes, like in this field, like part of what I'm doing right now is making sure, because we all know that we're going to hit that point. We all hit it. Yeah. I want to make sure when I hit that point, there's other people. So I can just step in an admin role and go be CEO. <laughs> Yeah. To build your business up to a point where other people can do it. But I don't think people, I don't think people are honest about getting to that point. I can't see me doing therapy forever. And I see people do it till they're miserable and I just, I can't do it. And that's not healthy for anybody. And I think that's what happened to me with fitness is I just hit a point where I was like, I'm so done with this. I need to go a different route. I need to do something different. So I fully expect that's what's going to happen here. And if it doesn't, okay. Yeah. You look so happy in this position. Uh, and not only was I overweight, but I was eating tons of dairy, which I am very allergic to. I have GERD. And so also like red sauces, pastas, anything like that. I shouldn't be eating. It tears my stomach up. Right. And then I was drinking the wine and the dairy. And then I'd wonder why I'd be shitting the rest of the night because you just abused your body. Yep. Now I can have both of those things. Now I can have a little bit of mac and cheese on Christmas. But I can't have a lot like what I used to have. And I still don't feel good afterwards. It's kind of like you're going to have it this one day. You're going to get it out of your system. It's going to be over. There you go. And then eventually you just don't do that. That's that's the future. Really? At all? There will, there will come a year where you're just like, nah, I'm good. Probably. Because even this year, I noticed I just had like a bite. And everybody's like, you're not going to finish that. I'm like, I can't. I, I don't want it. I think it I'm so used to having it. Yeah, there just comes a point where you're just like, no, it's just not worth it. But your brain does it for you. Okay. So you don't, I, I wouldn't, if it's once a year, I wouldn't stress about it. But, and I did that. All of a sudden it was like, I just didn't want it. Anymore. And you, you used to eat small bits of cheese and stuff. You don't do it anymore? Oh my gosh. I will occasionally have sheep and goat cheese, but not very much anymore. There's this, so follow your heart has a feta, a vegan feta. Okay. I've not looked at the label. I'm not going to look at the label because it tastes delicious. <laughs> okay. I know it's not soy and I know it's not coconut. Um, that's all oh, I that's right. You're allergic to coconut too, right? No, I can no. do coconut. I just don't really. I'm just like, yeah. Okay. I can do it. Um, but yeah, the, the follow your heart, they have a vegan or a feta and like, you know, um, black and blue burgers. I haven't had those yet. Okay. So black and blue burgers, what it is, is it's a burger with blue cheese and bacon. Okay. Oh, and they used to be my favorite. And then I couldn't eat it. Blue cheese was one of those things that was immediately off the table, right? Um, this vegan feta, and they have a vegan blue cheese too, but mm -mm, no. Okay. <laughs> the vegan feta is the perfect replacement for it. Is it ranch that has milk in it? Mm -hmm. It has buttermilk. Yeah. I, I can't. There is a ranch vinaigrette out there. I'll have to, when I find it, I'll send you a picture. Okay. But I noticed these things. I always thought it was me. And then I had something and I looked at it. It was like a salad or something healthy, but I had like ranch or something on it. And I felt like violently ill afterwards. And I was like, I can't have dairy. Like I cannot have dairy. And I keep having things with dairy in them. Yep. Yep. And if it I think just your brain goes, we're not doing this anymore. The other day, Bonnie, I had a cookie. My son made cookies. I didn't even, I ate it. And I was like, why did I eat that? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. You're getting I'm there. I'm getting there. Is it? I wonder if I should go back and read that thing I did a long time ago, that the uh, intolerance test. Is it the same now? No, it wouldn't be. You're different. Yeah, it wouldn't be. How long does that last? Well, so the intolerance test that you did at that point, you could have the same results today, but your body's changed since then. Okay. It's changed since then. So they're still super cheap. The check my body health is still super cheap. So if you ever wanted to redo it, let me know. But one thing I would say is if you're going to redo it, get to the place where you feel stable 
on what you're doing. Does that make sense? So, well, it means not now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say now. I would say give it means a couple months into this job. Yes. Okay. Because this job is so much more flexible that I'm not going in every day. So meal prepping, staying home some days, like it, it's just going to give me the quality of life I want. I don't know if you remember, but when I lived in North Carolina, I was doing the same job. So when Christy and I were going to yoga every day, when I was doing things, you know, that was when my sister was dying. So I wasn't the healthiest, but my lifestyle was healthier. Right. And so I just think this job gives me a better balance for me that maybe in about three months, I'll do it. Is that yeah. how long you think? Yes. Yeah. That's okay. a perfect time frame. Because what's going to happen is the stress that you've been under and the anxiety that you've been dealing with, they're going to skew. Constant. Them. Like to the point where I wanted to go back on it. I, like I used to have a stash of Ativan, but one 30 day, like a 30 day stash would last me six months. Cause I use them for MRIs. Um, cause a full body MRI is like three hours. So yeah. 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 But I got to the point where if I had that, I would have wanted to take it every night because my anxiety has been like busting out and I've had to like, and I think for me to put a cap on it every day to go into work has been so unhealthy. Yes. If I could have just walked out six months ago and said, fuck it, I'm done. Sorry for the worry, but I would have, I just feel like I wanted to scream all the time. And I don't know. I knew not to go into the job, but then when I got there, I was like, oh, maybe I like it again. And I was like, I don't, I don't like it anymore. I don't like doing it. Yeah. But now, you know, yeah, it was a hard reality because I always saw myself as a therapist, you know, so yeah. to see yourself as a therapist and stop liking doing that. I'm going to be a therapeutic person, but I don't want to do therapy. Anymore. And I think a lot of it, too, was this last health care. Um, I thought I had a sarcoma on my ribs. I prepared for it. I had to raise all this money for it. I really thought my way of life was going to be dramatically changed. And when I went, woke up from the surgery, they said my breast implant. Um, exploded yeah, I remember yeah so since that time I have been very different I can tell you I have I was not even I was not well for a while and I'm sure it caused some mild PTSD symptoms for me because now I worry about getting sick again and to know that the therapy kind of keeps me feeling like I have to go to work all the time that you can't get sick it I can't do it right right no I mean I could do it I don't want to do it to myself yeah and if you don't have to why if you have I a don't. way to get out I don't you know, and anything that you, any testing you do over the next six weeks is going to be skewed. Okay. All right. So I need to do that more. And I just want to do better in 2024. I didn't send any resolutions. I didn't say I'm going to do this or do that. I just, for me, want to do the things that make me happy to talking to the people I want in my life, exercising more. I'm not going to say how many days of the week. Cause I just feel like if I do better, then I'll do better. Yeah. Period. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. I hit, I decided on a word I'm doing quarterly goals and my word for the year is abundant because okay. I like stop talking to so many people and you I have to, to you, you know, your head gets buried because there's so much going on. And this year it's like the end of last year. I realized that if I don't have my people, all my people, and I'm not talking to people, then I don't feel like me. And I finally started feeling like me again, but we got what we thought was our very last no, the day I flew into North Carolina, which no, is I remember right before I met you. Mm -hmm. And, um, your husband was crushed. Yeah, he was he was devastated. And you guys talking to him is really the only reason I think he was able to process through that. He was ready not to try again. He was done. Yeah, he was done. And then a couple of months later, not even that, I think it was a month later, he's like, okay. You know, because we got a report from the doctor spelling out exactly what went wrong. Oh, wow. That's he, priceless. Yeah, he laid it all out. And said, we want to do this again with you. We want one more try. Here's what has to be put in place. And I I still didn't think it was going to happen. But no, you did not. <laughs> like I, I was fully prepared to drink my way through December. Not remember Christmas because I was going to be hammered. Yeah. And then, you know, January 1st, moving on. <laughs> I got pregnant Christmas morning oh my on my God. last fertility, on my last pill. And it was not a very memorable experience. It was kind of like, hey, let's do this. And we didn't go home for the holidays. And we decided to mourn not having a baby naturally. Um, and I was pregnant that morning. But it was six years for us. Yeah. Six years. That's I probably shouldn't have gone on that long without much medical help. But, you know, it is no. what it is. I mean, we tried for a couple of years with using just herbs and acupuncture and, you know, all the natural. And then when that didn't work, it was like, oh, okay, we, we don't have a choice now. Right. You know, it would have been something different. And I think had we gone to the second doctor the first time, mm -hmm. wouldn't have been as old. I think we would have gotten pregnant that first year because he was so brutally honest. 
you know, and, and he was kind about it, which okay. is a skill. Yeah, it is. I don't always have that skill. I, I can be very blunt with people and like, it's not that I'm trying to hurt feelings, but because of how it comes across, it just is what it is. And this guy right. was very genuinely kind about it. He was really good in his delivery and brought out the science, showed us descriptions, scientific studies, pictures, described everything in detail of why age is a factor and how it needs to be combated and what he saw in our tests and wow. the whole nine yards. And I think had we run into him first, we would have had- but How old were you when you got pregnant? 46. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, I think I'm I'm hyper focused on little things. Like you know, I'm losing weight, which is great. But then, like you know, you get the little drips that have to. Yeah, catch but up. I don't see it. I think you look younger and more amazing than you've ever looked. I think you look young. I didn't even know you were like 49. You're going to be 50. No, I'm going to be 51. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Don't it, you feel like you look younger? I feel like I look younger for sure. I don't think I look, you know, like I used to, I was always told I was, I look 10 years younger. That's so I told my brother about last year, I was like, he and I are a couple months apart. And I was like, we are turning 40 this year. When I moved to Austin, I stuck up for you. You told everyone you were several years younger. So now we're turning 40. We are not turning 50. We're turning 40. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, what story did you want me to tell? What were you saying? Um, I want my, my journey. Yes. My yes. cancer journey, my. You can tell whatever journey you want. You can tell whatever um, because I think there is so much hope in it and so much inspiration in it. Um, I would say so. Growing up, I always had a lot of little things happen. Um, I went to the doctor, not a lot, but a lot was wrong with me. Like I had, um, I had a spot on my heart that I felt hurt all the time, and so my mom would take me to the doctors, and they just kept saying maybe she bumped it, whatever. But it was where my tumor wound up to be years later. But um, my sister got um, cancer. And then at the same time, my dad had prostate cancer. And then my dad passed away when I was 35. And then I got cancer. Um, so I was 35. I got, no, nope. so wait, my dad passed away when I was, I want to say, okay, so I said 35, 30. And then a couple of years later, I had Mason. And then when Mason was two, my nipples started bleeding. And it wasn't, it didn't feel like the normal, um, it's something that I feel like my, my breast hurt. And so I went to the doctor and they were like, you have a tumor. And I was like, okay. So I went through most of it by myself, like getting the biopsy, getting everything done. Um, I was really kind of just matter of fact about it. Um, mm -hmm. I really didn't think about what was going to happen. It was just like, I know I had to do something. I have this little boy and I had to figure it out. So when I found that I had cancer, my sister called me about a week later and said, you know what? I hate for you to go through this alone. So she had cancer again. And so we both had breast cancer at the same time. And so I decided to go to MD Anderson because years before in my 20s, I found out I had thrombocytopenia. I was like passing out and I had a blood disorder. They found out that I had only 10% bone marrow. No. Oh. Yeah. And they found out that, that she said, I'm a cow that doesn't produce a lot of milk. There's, there's no way to explain it, which is really annoying, but I had all these bone marrows and there was no way to explain it. So I was already in MD Anderson. And so when I got cancer, I went back and this geneticist pulled me aside and she's like, your dad had cancer, your sister had cancer, now you have cancer. She's like, something's not right. And she's like, I want to do this test on you, but it costs thousands of dollars then. It doesn't now. Um, she's like, but I need you to sign a waiver because if they charge you for it, you'll be liable. She's like, call your, I was really young. So she's like, call your mom, see what they say. So I called my mom. My mom's like, whatever, we'll help you. So that's when I found out I had leave for mini syndrome. So leave for mini syndrome means that I only have one P53 and P53 is the gene that makes your body um, fight cancer. And so at any point I can get cancer. They have, I have a 90% chance of getting breast cancer. So I already did that. And then I have to get tested every six months for a brain tumor. And then every six months after that for full body. And then I have to have a colonoscopy every year. And so I'm always at the risk of getting cancer. Now, my sister had cancer by the time she passed nine times. Um, yeah, nine different, like nine occurrences of cancer. I want to say she had four or five different ones, but nine times because she was in surveillance the way I have been since finding out. Now, when I found out, like she had already had cancer several times in treatment. Um, I had to have radiation, but when you have leafomania, you're not supposed to have like, radiation because it actually can grow your cancer. Okay. But I had inoperable cancer behind my breastbone where, as a child, I said it hurt. Um, 
And so it was about a year of treatment. And at that time I had an MCL tear that I was supposed to have surgery for. And so they postponed that. And the same week I had, I was supposed to have my knee repaired is when I got my double mastectomy. And because of my blood disorder, we did treatment backwards because usually you do chemo radiation and then you take out whatever is left of your tumor. And they did it backwards because if I got sick, they couldn't go back and take the tumor. So they did the double mastectomy first and then the chemo slowly. And then I had to live at MD Anderson for six weeks to have my radiation. Why my son was two and at home with his dad. So I lived there by myself. I don't remember most of it because you sleep a lot with radiation, but I just kind of, um, I thought that when I was done with cancer, that's when it was over. You know, that's when you start living. And for me, that's when the hard part started. I have such body, I don't want to say body dysmorphia because I don't have it to that extreme, but I have such body issues, having no breasts at an early age and then having breasts and being thin all my life and then getting really big and being bloated. And like, when you look at most people with cancer, they're just swollen. Mm -hmm. And th nobody tells you that's going to go away. Or um, I had no use of my right arm. I had cording, so I had no use of my right arm. Like now I can use it. But <clears throat> it took me five reconstructions to have breasts that look like breasts. And for someone who was very active and likes yoga and likes doing things, to have a chest that looks so disfigured, I didn't want to go to the gym. Did I realize that then? No. Um, it wasn't until now, 10 years later, that I just got my wonderful nipple tattoos that make me feel whole again, that I didn't realize how incomplete and how not myself I felt for a total of 10 years. You know, I hate to admit it, but I have been so not myself since I had cancer um, because your body's totally different. What I can do with my body is different. What, like people look at me and I look able, but if you drop something in front of me as an old lady, I'm not picking it up for you because I'm going to hurt myself doing it. And it's hard for me because I was going to Orange Theory for a while and I look capable, but I'm not. And I was just kept injuring myself and injuring myself and injuring myself. One, because I'm not taking care of myself the right way, but two, because I'm not realizing I have limitations. Having leukemia, having cancer, you know, having chemo and radiation and just living with a chronic disorder and knowing you have a chronic disorder, I just have limitations. And it's um, something that I just know now and I didn't realize that I want to tell you until we moved like a year ago you know I feel like I've evolved so many times but I feel like this is the healthiest evolution you know what I mean like I finally feel like I'm really on a path to happiness some of that started as you know when I joined Savvy so Savvy is a non profit well it's an MLM which some people hate but it sells clothing um, it sells nutrition it sells uh, beauty products but it's all natural but the reason Savvy helped me is not because I made money from it it's because it put me around a, a, a bunch of beautiful women who I finally felt accepted me for me and allowed me to be myself. Like I didn't feel like I had to earn them. Yes. Um, and it made me start this ex body acceptance as my body was. And I had people telling me I was beautiful when I was overweight, when I was chunky, when I was this, when I was that. And it's not necessarily the people, it was the start of a journey for me. And my husband was very supportive because he's like, you wear yoga clothes all the time. and I really believe that we don't have many choices in life, but where we spend our money and who we spend our time with, it's a choice. And so buying products that I feel someone went out and made in a way that was as sustainable or as healthy or as, you know, I don't want to say honest, but really looking at every factor as you can. When I buy a savvy product, I know Jen tried to put the best products in there for me. I know that the way she is and when I take something, you know, it's because her mother had cancer also, by the way, and died from cancer. And so that really made me look at the way I treat my body inside and out and what I put in my body and on my body. And that started me the process of kind of stop making excuses and starting to live a lot healthier. Um, and so I just lost the weight, but I can say to you, I really feel like I tried to start losing it a year and a half ago. But sense. it took a lot of mental work for me and a lot of change and probably the scare of having cancer a second time. Um, to get me to where I am now that I have to put myself first. Um, but I just feel so much stronger than I've ever felt. I'm definitely not there yet, but I feel like I'm going to be there. I feel like I'm going to have, you know, there are many times where I'm like just done with my marriage and it's just because it's hard work. Um, but when you look at all our marriage has been through and that we still love each other and we still want to be with you, why would you give that up? Why would you not fight for that? You know? Um, so I just see that we are going to have such an amazing life. And I thought we'd have it by now, but it's just beginning. You know, um, I'm just beginning to walk again, to take public transportation to work, to walk during the day. Um, my husband gets excited to go walking on the weekends or do something. I just, I don't know. I'm excited to see where I'll be in a year. 
but I need to keep telling myself to be patient because the stress I've had accepting things that I shouldn't have been accepting has played a toll. Like being in a job I didn't want just because I was good at it. Um, my boss is retiring and they wanted me to take his job and be a director. And they're like, you would be good at it. And I had to say to them, I would be good at it, but I don't want it. Yeah. I want a job where at night I can just forget about it. I don't want to keep, I carry people's stuff and I have enough stuff on my own that I don't want to carry other people's stuff. Unless it's like someone I love or my friend, I don't want to be carrying a whole bunch of stranger stuff. Yeah. It's hard. You, you know, as a therapist, as a, a coach and um, a practitioner, you have to find that balance. Yeah. You have to find a balance. Like I, have- and I think I love too hard. Like I just need to stick to friends. You know, I'm just, I'm done pouring myself into clients, especially those that aren't pouring back. Somebody, it's somebody else's turn. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. And I think definitely um, something I was researching a long time ago is PTSD and cancer. And I want to get back. You know? Yeah. And I know for me, I'm going to, um, I'm going to do, I have a spin bike and I need to get back on it because it's downstairs, but I need to find hot yoga close to here because it makes me happy. And I realize I can't fit it in my life to go three every day. I can't, but if I'm doing it occasionally, it just, it does something for my body being in that warm environment, moving in it. It does something for my muscles, my bones, my chronic pain. It just does something for me. So that's something I need to get back into. Yeah. Let me know when you get on your spin bike. Cause we still have the Peloton. Do you ever use it? Um, about once a month at this point, but I love it. I love it. It's just getting on. Finding it. time to do it. Yeah. 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 And having the motivation to actually get on, you know, for 15, 20 minutes when I could just relax. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing too. I used to think I had to be on something forever and 15, 20 minutes would be better than nothing. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, truth be told, I do really well with 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Really well with that time frame. It, it's a good, right. It clears my head. Maybe I'm going to try that tomorrow morning. Maybe I should just think, oh, I haven't set it up, but maybe I'll go set it up and try in the morning. Yeah. But I'm definitely motivated from you. Thank you. We need I to- always love talking to you. We have to talk more. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we already did it. Yay. Yay. I don't want to keep you too long from the boys though. I know they need you. Is oh. your work day done after me? Oh yes, it is okay. done. I'm if you need perfect. more from me, you call me or tell me. I'm sorry if I was all over the place. I've just enjoyed you. I love it. Uh, the one thing I realized, um, and that's part of the reason I was like, I need to just have guests on my podcast. First of all, they do really well. But second, um, I have such great conversations. And then I have to like, with the one that I did just the other day, Carrie and I could talk for hours and I just met her. And I learned so much from you. Like you answer nutritional things in such an easy way that I just get it. Thank you. Yeah. You're just, it's your craft. Thank you. It's, it's fascinating to me. Oh, I love this field. I love everything about it. But like I told you before, I don't think I'm always going to be a nutritionist. I wouldn't mind being somebody else that like helps others. But like, this- I think you'll always be contributing to it in some way. Mm-hmm. And yeah. even if that means you setting it up and mentoring others, you know, not all of us can set it up. Some of us need other. I have no desire to have my own practice. But if someone had their own practice, I would come in and see some clients. But some of us don't desire to do that. So I think there's a place for everyone. I, agree. I really think you should do something with kids nutrition, but that's just me. I will get there. I am uh, I'm learning a lot with these coloring books. book or something. What you can get those boys to eat. You, you don't realize it's a big deal. <laughs> well, and you started that from day one. I did. I did. And I even started them on food way sooner than the doctors told me I could, but Drew was trying to eat my food. Yeah. Mason used to eat my eggs. Yeah. Four months old. He was trying to eat all my food. Do you know, it took me until six months ago to get the boys to eat eggs. Really? They wouldn't eat them. See, and I would, I only eat scrambled eggs. I never developed a liking for eggs any other way. I eat boiled too, but I have a consistency thing. So anything, and they have to be cooked hard or well. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Consistency is a big deal. I'm sure my son got it on us. A lot of his stuff comes from me. That's all right. It works. <laughs> that was crazy. Oh, all right. Well, I'm going to let you go. Cause I know. All right. Love you. Miss you. Talk to you soon. Okay.